I thank Professor Amos Korchin for handing me a challenging and an honorable responsibility. It is also a great privilege to share this virtual platform with headache medicine maestros like Dr. Patricia. These are my disclosures. I have divided this lecture into three parts. The first part is understanding what we already know about this topic. In the second part, I will mention what I will not be talking about and the reasons behind it. The third part is how I have contributed to this corpus of knowledge. Having treated about 150 patients with CGRP monoclonals, followed up over one year, I have come across CGRP responders, CGRP non-responders, and CGRP super responders. Now we all have seen such patients. We all know that CGRP monoclonals reduce the monthly migraine days, more than placebo and that the 50% responder rates are significant. We also know that perhaps three months is not enough to assess efficacy. Why? Because the first three months are more likely to be placebo effects. I am not going to talk about post hoc analyses as they are a priori unspecified tests, tests after seeing the data and then deciding which comparisons may be interesting. It is prone to type one error and data dredging. I am not going to talk about real world experience, which is different from clinical trials. Why? Because of conflated placebo effects, data dredging, and patient reported outcomes extraction from other electronic health records as patients move between health providers. Examples of contextual effects at patient assessment can include salvage by trying add-ons, attributions to the normal migraine fluxes and bad months, highlighting that there's nothing else available, so possibly let's continue for a while. So even six months may not be really enough. We would like to assume that trials are robust, but there may be publication biases. That data reporting is reliable, but there may be an interviewer bias and recall bias. That data analysis and publication is reliable, but there may be a citation bias and an editorial bias. This systematic review and meta-analysis published three months back by Ray Wun B. Forbes et al. highlighted that two thirds of the beneficial effects of CGRP monoclonals is due to contextual effects. Factors such as the mode of administration, injection or tablet, the clinical environment, expectations and beliefs of the patient, and the attitude or manner of the treating physician all contribute to this contextual effect. Now, these are cognitive biases for patients. The first one, attractiveness effect, is not just for patients, but also healthcare providers. As the world's first designer molecule for migraine. A very expensive medication, but you're on a trial and you get it for free. 
I'm sorry, but there's going to be a long wait before we can offer to you as we're going by waiting lists for appointments. There are hardly any side effects compared to all the other oral medications, which were in fact meant for other diseases. It blocks the molecule that is responsible for your headache. For the Trekkies out there, this slide is to highlight the differences between a Vulcan and a Betazoid way of thinking. What I presented so far is a Vulcan logic, which tries to tease out the placebo effects. A Betazoid argument would be, life is a combination. Let it be contextual, so what? And that's how most of headache medicine trials are anyway. However, this creates a problem and a solution too when it comes to a stopping criteria because different placebo response rates can lead to an efficacy paradox where a more powerful intervention with a less contextual effect is less likely to reduce symptoms in real life than a less powerful drug with a greater contextual effect. So for evidence-based medicine and evidence-based practice, I would need to integrate best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values to achieve the best possible clinical management and do a critical appraisal especially in developing countries with shortage of funds and when medical care systems polluted by lobbies. We do not have any doubt that there is a reduction in monthly migraine days, contextual effect or otherwise. I was more interested in the non-headache symptoms of migraine, like vertigos, brain fog, memory impairment, language impairment, anxiety and depression, aura and allodynia, all of which can affect the quality of life of the patient. A review of literature revealed that only one systematic review analyzed migraine related disability in patients with, uh, treated with galcanizumab. There were no systematic reviews to evaluate RCTs of CGRP monoclonals on migraine-related disability impact and quality of life after three months. Thus, we undertook this systematic review and meta-analysis to assess the effects of CGRP monoclonals for migraine on the frequency of migraine, accompaniments of migraine, disability, impact and quality of life. This work is not yet published. We conducted a literature search to identify phase three randomized control trials on CGRP monoclonals for migraine prevention. The primary outcome was the change in migraine days, acute migraine medication days, and 50% responder rate. The secondary outcome was change in the patient functioning and quality of life. Using quality of life indexes in migraine, like the MSQ, that's the Migraine Specific Quality of Life Questionnaire, migraine um, um, disability, um, assessment questionnaire, MIDAS, headache impact test, HIT6, migraine physical function impact diary, MPFID. We included double-blinded placebo-controlled RCTs for episodic and chronic migraine of any dose or administration methods with presence of outcomes after three months and no restriction of the publication status. We excluded RCTs of less than six months duration 
CGRP small molecule antagonists, non-double blinded RCTs, and those without a migraine related disability outcome. This is the PRISMA study flow, which identified 1,526 records, 942 duplicates which were removed, 584 records screened by title and abstracts, 19 full text articles assessed for eligibility, of which four articles underwent a risk of bias assessment. The seven item criterion review manager software version 5.4 provided by the Cochrane collaboration showed only a minimal bias, except for the HALO LTS where the physician was unblinded. The HALO LTS was not placebo controlled. STRIVE study showed MPFID everyday activity score reduce in 70 and 140 milligrams and also in placebo groups by 5.5, 5.9 and 3.3 respectively. The physical impairment score reduced by 4.2, 4.8 and 2.4 in 70, 140 milligram and the placebo groups respectively. Evolve 1 had a change in the patient global impression severity, minus 1.6 for both the 120 and 240 milligrams of galcanizumab with minus 1.3 for placebo. And there was an increase in MSQ, 32.4, 32 and 24.7 in the three groups respectively. Evolve 2 showed a reduction in the MIDA score by minus 21.2, minus 20.2 and minus 12 in 120, 240 and placebo groups respectively. The MSQ increased 28.5, 27 and 19.7 in three groups respectively. This is the data. Now, what are the limitations of the systematic review? One of it is that the studies were restricted by the above eligibility criteria. MIDAS, HIT6 and MSQ are prone to recall bias because they are monthly assessments. M MIDAS or modified MIDAS is not yet validated and may underestimate uh, the patient's actual burden. So my verdict for this debate is that there is no enough data to say whether CGRP monoclonal antibodies are a grand placebo or not a grand placebo. Because only three placebo controlled RCTs looked at quality of life beyond three months. And there is a need to perform good RCTs to evaluate the efficacy of all the anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies on migraine characteristics, migraine related disability, impact and quality of life on a longer time frame, six to 12 months. There is a need to categorize responses for different migraine populations such as high frequency episodic migraine, chronic migraine, medication overuse, headache, and refractory migraine. I conclude by saying that it is better to start from a position that something may work rather than it must work. An extreme nihilistic position does not help at all. Intervention may not work or may work marginally. In the words of Harlow, on the other hand, over optimism fueled by too many drug company dinners is equally damaging. 
Well-informed uncertainty is a legitimate professional position, but it must not lead to paralysis of action in individual cases, even if the action is to do nothing. With this, ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case and the verdict is yours. Thank you.